really is amazing, isn't it? Electricity. The effect just a tiny bit can have on an entire room. Do you ever just stop and think about it for a couple minutes? How it works? Everything it can do? Everything we use it for? Or maybe, do you remember the last time we had to live without it? Do you remember this? Do you remember how much we complained? And what was that, 48 hours? Isn't it amazing how electricity literally defines our lives? <clears throat> Is there anyone here that doesn't believe that the lives we lead as we know them aren't made possible wholly in part by our access to electricity? Okay, then I want you to take a look around this room. And no, not at all the equipment you might just be noticing, but I want you to take a look at each other. Because there are over 400 people in this room with us today. That is a lot of people. And if there were 400 families in our city that didn't have power, that would be a serious, serious problem. What I want you to realize is that for every face you can see here today, they represent four million people that live every single day without any power. That is over a billion and a half people that are powerless in every sense of the word. You can turn the lights back on now. It's great to be able to say that, isn't it? I'm here to get you to think. I'm here to get you to realize that if we could just bring a little bit of power to the billion and a half people that don't have any of it, we would save the world. You see, for the people that don't have it, power will do more for them than all the vaccines we give, all the money we donate, all the buildings we build, all the aid we currently supply. How? How is that even possible? It's possible because power is the foundation with which we supply that aid in the first place. Trust me when I say it, if we didn't have power, you couldn't bother us with anyone else's problems, no matter how severe. We're throwing band-aids on serious problems that need to be cured. You see, electricity is power, but not the power just to light a light bulb. Power in its broadest sense. Power to empower things, but not just things, people. You see, electricity is like money. We don't work our jobs to get paychecks with the intention of never spending it. No, just like we don't build our homes, wire them for electricity just to sit in front of an outlet and say, you know, I'm never going to use it, but isn't it amazing? No, it's important because of what it lets us do. Everything. Everything. And conversely, without it, we have nothing. We are powerless. Okay, I'll bite. So how do we go about that? How do we even begin to go about empowering a billion and a half people? I mean, come on. When, how long has it been since we all complained about gas prices? Well, there is one source of power that is both free and constant and available all around the world. That's right. I am alluding to solar. You see, solar technology is the only energy technology which can be deployed anywhere in the world at anything near a reasonable cost. It has no moving parts, so it needs very little maintenance. And photovoltaic cells themselves, the solar panels, they last over 30 years, 
All of this is key if we're talking about empowering the most remote places of our planet. But solar is not without its challenges, just like everything in life worth having. And I know you all know what the challenge with solar is. Does anyone want to venture a guess? That's right. It's too expensive. We hear that all the time. It's too expensive. It's too expensive. Well, if it's so expensive, how could it possibly make sense to use it to empower a billion and a half people? Well, there's a funny thing with photovoltaics, a funny thing with solar panels, and it's that they like sunlight. This doesn't surprise anyone here, but it may surprise you what type of sunlight they like. They like. You see, solar panels like direct sunlight. We wouldn't install solar on our homes upside down. No, that would be silly. They wouldn't work. Just like they don't work so well if they're not getting direct sunlight when the sun is rising in the morning or setting in the evening or the 46 degree change between the summer solstice and the winter solstice. All of this is working against solar panels and keeping them from generating the maximum possible amount of electricity, which is a serious problem when you're investing in already expensive solar panels. No, to actually m maximize your investment in solar, you need to employ some kind of tracking system. Now, traditionally, this has been done with automatic trackers, which are very large, often very complicated, very expensive. They take specialized machinery to install, specialized technicians to maintain, and heaven forbid, one of the many moving parts that they have breaks down. You're now stuck with a dead system that you have to wait for a technician to come out and fix it. And this is the other challenge with solar, and it's a challenge that's not solely confined to the solar industry itself. No, it's a challenge with the energy industry as a whole. You see, the energy industry is a very exciting industry. It's very dynamic. There's a lot of money into it. There's a lot of research and design. There's new products constantly coming onto the market that are changing the way we think about solar. They're changing the way we think about where we get power, how we get power, how much it costs. But there's an interesting thing about this too. These innovations go to a specific group of people. Can you guess who those people are? They're the people with an already abundant supply of power. So we're providing the people who already have more power than we can use already with more options, more power, more solutions, yet the people who have nothing stay with nothing. They remain powerless. Just never felt right to me. And the innovation needed to start taking some of this technology and making it applicable for those billion and a half people in those places around the world is not hard. In fact, I bet we can walk through some questions and by the time we leave here, come up with a smarter, simpler, lower cost way to provide a power solution to these people. So if we were going to do that, where would we start? We would start with solar. If we're going to talk about bringing power across the whole world, the only place to start is solar. But instead of these big, large solar arrays, no, we need something that its size makes sense for where it's going. We're not talking about utility scale power here. We're talking about single small villages, maybe single buildings at a time. So we want to start with something that, that fits the size and the scale of what we're talking about. But then we have to think, Transportation is an issue. Remember, because again, we're talking about the remote, the most remote places on Earth. So what we would need would have to be transportable. It, it would have to be able to break down even and then build out like a big erector set on site. And probably most importantly, it would have to fit in the back of a pickup truck. Because it, if it can fit in the back of a pickup truck, well, then we can get it just about anywhere in the world. That's not so bad. We're getting there. Now, do we want to think about solar tracking? I mean, the idea behind solar tracking is great, but we can't afford to have any of this expensive machinery that can break these motors, the gear drives, the computers, the photo sensors. None of that will work in these places. No, we need, we need something else. We need, a, we need like a person to be the motor. There's an idea. We need a person to be the motor. We need a person to make the adjustments. And, well, that still doesn't work because we can't have a person out there continuously tracking the sun. They, they would be standing there for 12 hours a day. That doesn't make sense. No, what we would need would be something like a, like a morning position 
and then a position for the afternoon, and then a position for the evening, like three settings. That's not so bad. Takes 30 seconds each. But then we're still faced with the problem that we'd have to simplify the solar algorithms that all solar tracking is based upon. And we'd have to get it down to something so simple, something so foolproof that anyone, depending on where they're from or what language they speak or how old they are or anything, could be able to use it without any training. We, we need something that's, that's universal, something like colors and numbers. There's an idea again. What if we color-coded the solar algorithms into something that anyone can understand where all they have to know is maybe what month it is and whether it's the morning, the afternoon, or the evening, and they just match the numbers. How about that? And for icing on the cake, what if we made it right here in our city and exported it around the world? What we just went through is Sunflower Solutions the world's first manually operated solar tracking system designed to be specifically used in these remote places of the world to bring power to a billion and a half people. And it's not hard. I came up with it, come on. Uh, but it's, that innovation's not really the message I want you to leave here with. It's the importance of having power. And to that end, I want to tell you a story. It's the story of a school, a school called Mbaka Olomo outside of Kisumu, Kenya, a school that was adopted by several groups of Cornell students and professors. And these students and professors adopted this school because it was very rural, very poor, but very high performing. It has over 500 students. So sometime a year ago, almost two years ago now, they decided that they were going to raise money to bring that school a tiny amount of power. So they worked with us at Sunflower Solutions and we were able to supply them a system for a third off their budget. But that's not even the important part. The important part is what that tiny amount of power has done for that school. You see, those students are able to study now. And not just that, but they're learning how to use computers in their computer lab. But it doesn't stop there because the Cornell students, they knew it was going to do that much. And that's the message that I want to hit home. Power doesn't stop there. It never stops. No, you see, the teachers at the school noticed that they had extra power, specifically on the weekends when the students weren't in school, but the solar was still doing its thing. So they started coming into the school seven days a week, and they started businesses. They started businesses. That school makes money now. They started businesses charging people cell phones for a small fee in the local community, teaching the community how to use computers, providing services to the community. And what did they do with that power? Well, you see, this school is special because this school doesn't turn away any child that wants an education. So that means they have a disproportionately high number of orphan children children whose parents have died of AIDS, children who don't know when their next meal is going to come. The school, taking the revenue that they've made from the businesses that they started, from the power that they now had, buys food to cook meals to give those children at least one reliable meal a day. And the community, the community that seemingly has no interest in a tiny primary school, that same community, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, volunteers that there, there is always a guard watching that tiny amount of solar power just to make sure nothing happens to it. That is how important that electricity has become to that entire community. And that is the power of electricity. So is it just electricity? Or is it something more? Is it the power to take those vaccines and store and refrigerate them and distribute them to more people? Is it the power to take what was once just a building and turn it into a school, a hospital, a business, or maybe all three? Is it just electricity? I don't think so. <laughs>